Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Campuses, Jews, and Israel, What Students Face This Fall. My name is Dexter Van Zyl, and I'm your host this afternoon. Our primary speaker today is Aviva Rosenschein, Cameron's International Campus Director. She is speaking to us today from the holy city of Jerusalem. Aviva is a Boston native and received her BA in journalism from the University of Massachusetts. She moved to Israel in 2013. Since 2008, Aviva has overseen the campus department, developing and implementing unique programs and strategies and content for colleges and universities throughout North America, the United Kingdom, and Israel. She's focused on expanding international operations and providing training and guidance to students. She has been published in the Jewish Chronicle, the Jerusalem Post, the Washington Free Beacon, and has appeared on Israel High Home and ILTV. Today, Aviva will speak about Cameron's efforts to counter anti-Israel propaganda on college campuses in the United States. After Aviva's presentation, I will speak briefly, I promise, about Cameron's role in countering anti-Israel propaganda at UMass Amherst. We will then continue with questions and answers and we really wanna hear from you. And during the course of Aviva's talk, you can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Good afternoon, Aviva. How are you? I'm doing great, Dexter. Thank you for the introduction. I first want to thank our many generous and caring donors and supporters of CAMERA. Without you, my staff and I wouldn't be able to provide any of the necessary resources and help the students across the country that we do every day. I've been with CAMERA for 12 years and started off as the sole member of the campus department. But since then, thanks to your support and concern about this critical work, we've hired another 10 professional campus staff members who over the years have connected with thousands of students. In addition to this, we are excited to announce the launch of our International Student Leadership Center. I'm sure that most of you joining us today know that support for our students is vital because you also know we have an anti-Semitism problem on American campuses. According to the Amcha Initiative, there has been an increase of Israel-related incidences, of anti-Israel-related incidences, up 60% from 121 in 2018 to 192 in 2019, and has been steadily rising over the last decade. What's causing this upsurge in anti-Semitism right now? There are a few basic answers. One that's powerfully affecting the campus climate for Jews relates directly to the faculty. With the rise of the faculty-driven boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, or BDS, that began in earnest with the American Studies Association passage of a pro-boycott res resolution in 2013, Faculty on many campuses have grown more politically active in promoting this bigoted campaign, as well as other extremist projects. This anti-Zionism activity is expressed in the form of sponsorship of pro-BDS panels, speakers, films, and other events, as well as the politicizing of departments, institutes, publications, and, and academic societies that defame Jews and the Jewish state. Studies show that universities with professors who support the boycott divestment sanctions movement against Israel were four to seven times more likely to have acts of anti-Jewish hostility occur. Activists, political professors, some who may very well harbor anti-Semitic sentiment, also too often use their classrooms as a platform to manipulate their students and spread propaganda instead of scholarly information. Professors, especially tenured ones, have complete control over what material their students study. I learned from my own experience at university that even when the syllabus material is proven to be biased or inaccurate, the dean of the department cannot even require, require the professors to adjust it. And when the professor in question is chair of the department, for example, Sue Jolly was the chair of the communications department at UMass Amherst, there is little recourse at all for an individual student. In addition to this, there are other forces and events as well fueling the rise of anti-Semitism in recent years. In 2014, not long after the ASA resolution on BDS, Hatem Bazian, tenured UC Berkeley professor of the Near Eastern and Ethnic Studies Department, 
and founder of Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP, the national student organization that promotes anti-Zionism on campus, called for the first day of action, which included urging students to engage in civil disobedience and ties and cooperation with all Israeli universities and scholars, and desist from all interaction with pro-Israel organizations or students. Stigmatize and ostracize pro-Israel students. That was the message. These direct calls from Professor Botstein led to the withdrawal of any form of dialogue and understanding amongst the pro-Israeli and anti-Israeli students. Many on the outside ask us why we as Israel activists don't try to engage with these anti-Israel students. The reason is because they are explicitly told not to interact with Zionists on any account. Student members of SJP who actually try to engage or debate with pro-Israeli students have been literally dragged away by other SJP members. We saw this anti-normalization doctrine come into effect the following years when Jewish students applying to run for student government were run one by one from UCLA and Stanford to the University of Michigan, questioned by their peers who happened to also be involved with SJP, SJP or their affiliates, how they would vote on the BDS referendum. Jewish students, based on their ethnic identity, were questioned where their loyalties lie, with the supposedly racist Israel supporters or with the peaceful human rights supporters of BDS. This was the litmus test Jewish students had to pass in order to run for student government at an American university. In some instances, there were humiliating school government interrogations of Jewish students that became public and triggered public outrage and blowback. Not long after 2016, with the advent of the so-called safe spaces and trigger warnings world used by millennials to safeguard them against any language, literature, or behavior that might make them feel uncomfortable, many universities across the US Ban began offering actual exclusive events for students to attend to share their feelings and concerns without judgment. That is, as long as their feelings and concerns were aligned with the anti-Israel consensus. A small liberal arts college in Massachusetts brought their 2,000 or so undergraduate students together to share their concerns regarding racism and discrimination that they may have felt on campus. One student decided to share the anti-Semitic abuse she'd been subjected to because of her open support for Israel. And at a place that insists upon no judgmental comments about others to such a degree that quiet shaking of the head and disapproval about a comment can lead to dismissal from the room, this grievance prompted a roar of booing against a Jewish student. The faculty members leading the event did nothing to calm the room or support the student. So while students were uniting against any perceived form of discrimination or racism within the university setting, anti-Semitism anti appeared to be thriving. 2017 was another point, another turning point as the extreme fringe organization of Jewish Voice for Peace or JVP began creating student chapters on university campuses. Jewish Voice for Peace is anything but peaceful, supports the BDS movement, and have started and shared anti-Semitic conspiracy theories like their deadly exchange campaign blaming Israel for police violence in the US. There is a definite parallel between JVP's chapters on campuses and growing anti-Semitism. JVP's open support for BDS and co-sponsorship of many of SJP's events that have even crossed the line into anti-Semitism has sharply undermined the moderate Jewish and Zionist voices on many campuses. For instance, when a pro israel student accurately and honorably decries a BDS referendum, there is JVP speaking loudly as Jews to defend it. And any time a speaker is exposed for voicing an anti-Semitic comment, there is JVP to mock and discredit that accusation, invoking their supposed special authority as a Jewish organization. After all, would a Jewish organization co-host an anti-Semite? Of course, the answer is yes, JVP would. It cynically exploits its alleged Jewish identity in collaboration with the most radical anti-Israel groups, speakers, campaigns, and professors, often leading the campaigns themselves. 
So with the arrival of JVP student-led chapters, we have seen an overwhelming amount of events on campus hosted by SJP and JVP, supposedly defining what is anti-Semitism and, and outrageously declaring for the Jewish community that that Zionism plays no part in Judaism. While they, SJP and JVP members, believe that anti-Semitism should be condemned, to be anti-Zionism and to be anti-Zionist, according to these extremists, is a reasonable and honorable position to take against a supposed fascist and racist movement. So in this same year, 2017, SJP at the Uni University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign joined others in condemning the neo-Nazis who marched in Charlottesville by leading protests on their campus entitled Smashing Fascism. However, it's deemed by these students acceptable to include Zionism in their chant against white supremacy. Similarly, a year later, 2018, the SJP affiliate of Washington University in St. Louis mourned the victims of the Pittsburgh Tree of Life synagogue massacre alongside the Jewish community, while in the same breath condemned the invitation of an IDF reservist as he, in their eyes, was considered to be an emblem of white supremacy. So to summarize, we have faculty at the forefront leading the charge, advocating for the boycott of their peers in Israeli academia, using their classroom to propagate lies about the Israeli people, which gives rise to students becoming the leaders, advocating for some of the most insidious anti-Semitic activity. But neither the professors nor their protégés are alone, as they have their Jewish brethren, the fringe self-hating Jews who use their supposed Jew Jewishness to harm the Zionists and Jewish students by spreading their own anti-Semitic conspiracies and empowering groups like SJP to march forward with their hatred. I know that what I just described appears to be an overwhelmingly dark picture of the universities, but there is more to the landscape. Everything I mentioned is indeed happening. However, every example described was challenged, exposed, and many times condemned by the university leaders. Yes, more outrage needs to be heard, but the pro-Israel students camera works together with are not intimidated. Even when they are up against professors, people whom they are supposed to revere, they shout right back at them, as they know they are far braver and honorable than these unethical people who somehow managed to get an advanced degree. When JVP first began appearing on campus, before they even announced their agenda to the wider campus community, we had camera we at Camera had already provided our students with information that we had collected on the national organization. One of the Camera Fellows immediately put together an article just directly exposing them for their true intentions. We didn't wait for them to make the first move. We did. And though JVP's will to damage the pro-Israel community continues, we are not letting them do so without a fight. In Massachusetts, when that lone Jewish student was left to the mob, it was our camera fellow who spread the story leading to outrage within the community. And when the Washington University anti-Israel group tried to spark outrage against a planned event with an IDF reservist connecting him to white supremacy, the pro-Israel students showed up in droves to support the event. And our fellow published an article in the student-run newspaper decrying the anti-Israel group for their anti-Semitic rhetoric. When we publicize the despicable anti-Jewish bias, the whole campus then knows the facts and also sees that Israel has a strong, has strong articulate defenders. And we do. We've recruited the largest class of camera fellows ever, 60 on campuses on the US, Canada, UK, and Israel. The student op-eds published are well-researched and sourced articles, which are many times influenced by the work of camera's senior research staff and combating anti-Israel falsehoods that crop up in the media and then are regurgitated by the anti-Israel students. In addition to our camera fellowship, we also provide support to, thir to 35 student-led Israel organizations that are, part of camera on, uh, are part, that are part of our Camera on Campus Coalition. These students want to be the loud, proactive, and educated voice on Israel for their community. At Brooklyn College, for instance, SJP planned a week dedicated to demonizing Israel as an apartheid state, part of a campaign that was first coordinated in 2005 at the University of Toronto called Israel Apartheid Week. This absurd campaign has been held on campuses for the last 15 years, but not without confrontation. 
Camera staff immediately sprang to action to help the students at Brooklyn College confront this outrageous event by providing the students with well-produced posters and informational graphics addressing the false charges presented against Israel and proactively sharing historically factual information regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict. At Canberra, we, at Canberra, we refuse to allow any falsehood to go unanswered, whether it's coming from the pages of the New York Times, spoken by an Ivy League professor, or displayed on the campus quad by anti-Israel students. Now, what should we expect this coming year in the era of COVID-19? Let's start with the positive. Though in March, everything happening was new to all of us, professionals and students alike, and it wasn't clear how we would adjust to it, camera quickly adapted. By the end of March, multiple Zoom webinars had taken place, reaching thousands of our student followers online, and the camera fellows were ready and eager to host their planned in-person educational events online. In an unexpected discovery, students connected and reached their peers more easily in some ways than when recruiting for live events. And they were easily able to host webinar events with nearby universities, opening up exciting possibilities for reaching more students. We even have several international events hosted by student groups within CAMERA's coalition from across North America, the UK, and Israel. Articles were published proactively describing Israel's collaboration and sharing of resources with her Arab neighbors when COVID first hit, and later denouncing SJP for continuing to fuel the flames between Israelis and Palestinians by calling for BDS proposals to be considered in the middle of the pandemic, ignoring cooperation between the two people, something even the UN recognized. Over the last year, despite SJP and JVP's best efforts to separate anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism, the pro-Israel's community concerted efforts to push more and more universities to, to adopt anti-Semitism definitions, which include anti-Zionism, was successful. And though SJP exploited the murder of George, Flo George Floyd, invoking JPP's so-called deadly exchange campaign, in which Israel's accused of training American police officers to use deadly tactics against minority populations, hoping to stigmatize Zionism, we at camera will not let this succeed. Instead of shying away from the language as some pollsters have even recommended, we have launched an entire campaign based on defining Zionism, connecting it to modern day issues, emphasizing that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and exposing those who try to cast pro-Israel students as fascists and racists to be the ones perpetuating and supporting the discrimination against a minority community. And we're able to promote this campaign and others on campuses throughout the country because firstly, all of our campaigns are created with the support and help from our students. And despite COVID-19, our programs are booming attracting, for instance, the most attendings ever at our 10th Annual International Student Leadership Conference, which took place online this year. I hope all of you know how much you mean to our efforts. Our students are brave, but they need your support. And we cannot thank our many generous supporters enough who have allowed us to establish the International Student Leadership Center, permitting us to develop exciting new opportunities and programs. So I hope as we celebrate the new year, you'll remember the challenges our students face and continue to help us. Now I would like to pass our discussion over to my colleague, Senior Research Analyst Dexter Van Zyl. The campus department works closely with many of the analysts on issues that arise, such as the one Dexter has been working on for several years, anti-Israel faculty. Dexter is untangling the role of UMass Amherst Professor Sue Jolly in promoting anti-Israel propaganda. In fact, Dexter testified before the UMass Board of Trustees in December of 2019 and was instrumental in obtaining the apology of the president of the university. Having attended UMass Amherst and having felt the repercussions myself of Sue Jolly and his allies, I commend and deeply respect the efforts Dexter has applied to challenge the abuse of truth and scholarship about Israel. Please welcome Dexter Van Hi, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, on one hand, I'm very proud to be able to do the work that I do here at Camera, and on the other hand, I'm kind of ashamed that it is so necessary. Uh, and as many of you know, Camera's invested an awful lot of time uh, and effort and energy into countering the anti-Israel propaganda of such Ali. Uh, 
chairman of the communications department at UMass Amherst. And just recently he retired in June. Prior to his environment, he had, uh, retirement, he has used his statuses uh, at UMass to essentially promote a strident anti-Israel agenda. There was no question about it. He openly admitted that he viewed college classrooms as providing a captive audience for anti-Zionist films that he produced through the Media, Media Education Foundation, a nonprofit that he founded in 1992. And what he did was he basically would use MEF to, pro, pro, to construct these videos or make these movies. And then he would use his position as a communications chair at uh, UMass Amherst to broadcast them. Now the foundation's board of directors, MEF's board of directors includes uh, well-known anti-Israel propagandist Noam Chomsky and another individual by the name of Michelle Mushabek, a publisher who has produced and promoted several books that espouse 9-11 conspiracy theories. These are the people that uh, Sut Jali gets his inspiration from. And uh, it's kind of shocking. I, I don't want to get too much into the 9-11 uh, the, the conspiracy stuff, but if you believe that, you essentially think that the United States is a worthy target for violence, because if we're willing to uh, murder 3,000 of our own citizens to engage in some sort of war uh, against the world, you, you, that's kind of a libel against the United States. And you would think that that would be outside the cordon sanitaire or outside the realm of reasonable discourse, but apparently it's not. Now, MEF produced two anti-Israel films of note, the first being Peace Propaganda, and the Promised Land. That was in 2004. And then in 2016, MEF and Sut Jali produced The Occupation of the American Mind. Now, in the first film, he offered up a, a, a vaguely, a, you know, an obviously distorted view of the Arab Israeli conflict. His discussion of the Six Day War, for example, didn't mention at all any of the bellicose statements that uh, Arab countries had, or Arab leaders had made against Israel, didn't mention the closing of the Straits of Tehran. Uh, and, and essentially, you know, made it look like it, it, Israel was entirely responsible for that war. In the second film, The Occupation of the American Mind, Jolly portrayed American uh, pro-Israel activists in the United States as violating the norms of honest and open discussion uh, and discourse in American society. And he, ironically enough, he himself violated these norms in this film. In two instances, he altered the audio of network news programs to serve his ideological agenda. And I think this is really one of the things that really bothers me is, and it keeps shocking me again and again, is, is that I'm a you know, former newspaper reporter, and I know that if I manipulated quotes the way that he did, I, I probably would have gotten fired or at least yelled at pretty seriously, uh, and it would have been a public beating, so to speak. Uh, but the thing is, is he gets away with it. And these things happen a lot when people write about Israel for some reason. And it keeps shocking me every time it happens. And at a certain point, I should probably get used to it, but I still can't. Now, in one of the instances, Jolly quoted a reporter from NBC uh, stating that, quote, Israeli helicopter gunships deliberately fired a missile into a crowd of civilians last night. When, in fact, the reporter actually said that is, uh, Palestinians charged that Israeli helicopter gunships deliberately fired a missile into a crowd of civilians last night. So what he did was he took essentially a partisan uh, accusation from the Palestinians of uh, you know, deliberately slaughtering a bunch of Palestinians and turned it into a statement of fact by omitting those words. And that wasn't the only one that was a problem with this movie. There was a number of them. And you can find all the information or a lot of the information about this on camera's website under a, a title of an article, uh, Such Jolly Shameless Propaganda. Now, the thing is, is, is that I want to emphasize that manipulating the record in this manner would have damaged anyone's career in the fields of journalism or communications, which is essentially what Such Jolly is teaching. But the folks at UMass said it was not a problem because he didn't intend to deceive his audience. And if you look at the article, I think you'll have a very difficult time agreeing with that assessment. In addition to those movies, uh, he organized two anti-Israel pro-BDS events that took place in May and November of 2019. Speakers at these events included well-known anti-Zionists such as Roger Waters, Mark Lamont Hill, and Linda Sarsour. And the atmosphere at the event in May was simply appalling. And as documented by um, one of my colleagues at camera, Patrick Fox, 
One woman was shouted down and eventually hauled out of the auditorium where the event was taking place in May after she tried to raise the issue of Hamas rocket attacks. And essentially what would happen would be is, is that people would denounce these people and they'd be hauled out. Uh, and that's kind of, that's frightening because that's reminiscent of, of the ghetto bench that we saw in Poland. Essentially, anybody that you know, prior to the Holocaust, and I don't want to overstate it, but essentially what a lot of this activism does is it basically marginalizes and isolates pro-American Jews on college campuses. And, and UMass isn't the only place where this type of behavior takes place. And that's one of the reasons why cameras work is so important is because what we do is we give people the, the courage and the information and the, the companionship, frankly, uh, that pro-Israel students need on college campuses to fight against this impulse to marginalize and intimidate them and drive them into a corner. And the thing is, is that Patrick's coverage of this event was uh, crucial in our ability to challenge UMass Chancellor Kumbul Subhaswamy uh, about these events and about the atmosphere at UMass Amherst. And eventually later he ended up condemning the fact that one, the, the event that took place in November was so one-sided. I don't want to go into a blow-by-blow -blow description of everything that Cameron has done, like we, he said this and then he said that, but I can summarize our strategy. First, we documented the misinformation in Sut Jolly's movies, and particularly we emphasized the deceptive edits in his second film, The Occupation of the American Mind. Then we highlighted how these deceptive edits qualified as violations of the Code of Academic Freedom at UMass, uh, uh, Code of Academic Conduct at UMass Amherst. We filed complaints with the administration, asking that the school remonstrate with Jahali about his manipulation of the historical record. And when the administrators, and third, when the administrators failed to hold Jolly accountable, we highlighted their failure to do so and uh, their efforts to protect Sut Jolly under the name of academic freedom. And our response was, is that the revered principle of academic freedom does not provide cover to manipulate the historical record. And one of the things that I said all along, and I kept hammering on this point, and repetition is crucial, was that if students at UMass Amherst were to edit the historical record or alter it the way that Sut Jolly did, they would be sanctioned. They would have either gotten an F on the paper that they had written, they might have gotten an F for the class, and they could very well have had, you know, been expelled. But for one reason or another, Professor Jolly got away with it, even as he used these films in the classroom at UMass Amherst. And that brings us to Cameron's fourth strategy, which was to highlight Sut Jolly's abuse of public resources, namely the time in a college classroom. Uh, in a talk that he gave in Beirut in 2017, Jolly told his audience that he regarded the campus, it was important to get his films into the classroom because the main place we want to get it to and, and we encourage is the classroom because uh, that is a captive audience. And, uh, his direct quote, students have to watch, he said. If a professor says, we're going to watch this, we're going to talk about it, and it's on the test, they have to watch. And, that, and, and, then, and he says, we, we want to have that captive audience. Now, because of the assistance of a camera supporter who might actually be watching this event right now, we're able to document, and I want to thank you, we're able to document Jahali's use of a multiple choice exam to coerce his students into affirming the propaganda he put forth in his movie. What happened was, is that if you didn't pick the multiple choice answer that he wanted you to pick, you got a lower grade. And, and that is essentially ideological co uh, coercion. And so the thing is, is that th this brought us to our fifth strategy, which was highlighting the failure of public officials in the state of Massachusetts to stop people from abusing public resources and the students themselves at the Commonwealth's flagship land grant university. And if you read the articles we produced, we repeatedly reminded everyone that Massachusetts taxpayers supported UMass Amherst to the tune of $360 million a year from the state coffers and that Massachusetts families paid approximately $30,000 a year to send their children to school. And to allow Professor Jahali to abuse a public resource, namely time in the classroom, and engage in ideological co coercion of his students, 
is simply an insult to the taxpayers who pay the freight at the school. He was demanding that his students embrace a counterfactual narrative about the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that's an outrage. And so once we did this groundwork and once we prepared essentially the map or the, all of the information, camera felt prepared to bring the issue before UMass's Board of Trustees. So in December of 2019, I testified before the Board of Trustees telling them that uh, Satjali's abuse of the classroom is part of a larger problem of academics teaching that Israel uh, and the United States are part of a settler colonialist project that needs to be undermined and uh, dismantled. And one of the things that I added was, is that such a, an agenda of being promoted at a land grant in university such at UMass Amherst is outrageous because the land grant institution, uh, that legislation, which was passed in the 1860s, was promoted, was, was passed to promote the economic vitality of American civilization and not to undermine confidence in the United States. And one of the things that we have to understand is, is for an awful lot of these activists, Israel is the main show, but for other activists, Israel is a subsidiary part of an attack on the West, the United States, uh, Western civilization. And so what happens is that we have to kind of judge how our strategy is with each one of these folks. Cameron's work has had an impact. In late October, uh, UMass Chancellor Kumbul Subhaswamy's, you know, prior to the November uh, event that Sat Jali organized, uh, said that it was uh, troubling that such a one-dimensional event would take place on our campus. And after he made this statement, a member of the faculty who had been, we had been in contact with, sent us an email and said, congratulations, you and Cameron did it. Now, afterwards, we even got further confirmation that we were having a real impact when Satjali expressed his displeasure at the chancellor's statement, declaring in an email that was published in an anti-Zionist website that and they, meaning Camera, have filed formal complaints to the university and have written long exposés uh, about my shameless propaganda. And he went on to write, and when I say they, it is actually one sorry individual, Dexter Van Zyl, who has written every piece and filed every complaint. Now, I did that with an awful lot of help from my colleagues and, and, and my supervisors here at Camera, my, my mentors. And that's one of the most important things is that, it, you know, it looks like, you know, my name's on all of this, but it's all Camera. Now, one of the things that we've learned at, at Camera is that when people complain ab publicly about our work, we know that there have been an awful lot of private behind the scenes conversations about the issues that we've raised and they're not happy about it. And more, over the long haul, it's that that is how people's behaviors changed. And the fact that Jahali wrote such a direct and public attack on our work was further confirmation that we were having an impact. I'm quite grateful for the support Cameron and its supporters have given me in highlighting the problems at UMass Amherst. And I'm not just talking about the financial support, but the moral support. When I testified before the Board of Trustees about the problems at UMass Amherst, I knew I had the backing of thousands of camera supporters who've been with the organization and its staffers for decades. They were with cameras that counted the anti-Israel propaganda just, uh, used to justify terror against Israel in, in the Middle East and to intimidate Jews on American soil, which I find disgusting. And I knew that many of our supporters were also alums from the school at UMass Amherst, and they had contacted school officials to ask them what was going on at the school that they had attended and supported with their donations. And some, I knew that people had my back when I was testifying before the Board of Trustees. And I'll be honest with you, my hands were shaken as I read from my prepared remarks. But my voice was clear because of your support. And so with that, let's open it up for questions. Uh, and I'm going to check to see. And I've, we've got a list of questions that came in already. Um, but I'm also going to look at the Zoom uh, thing as well. Forgive me. And uh, I guess one of the questions for, for Aviva that I want to ask mm -hmm. is, do you think there's going to be any pent up energy surrounding campus activism when and if colleges and universities open again in January 2021? 
Thank you, Dexter. Um, that's a great question. And I have a very quick answer at first is yes, abso absolutely. I mean, there is already a lot of energy, energy on the campuses and they're not even open. Uh, Columbia University, for instance, just recently announced that they will, or privately announced, uh, that they're pushing forth with the, with the BDS petition that they had originally stalled that was planned for in the spring um, before pre-COVID. Um, that had to be postponed. Um, so they're pushing forth with BDS referendums on campuses. Uh, they have, they're using social media as a way to reach more and more students and are aggressively attacking um, Israeli supporters and Zionists. Um, and they are very much moving forward with their position that the connection between Palestinians and Africans and Americans is very real. Um, and if you are a supporter of Black Lives Matter and you are upset or, or aggravated against the violence that um, some see are against the African Americans in America, then you should feel the same because the Palestinians are being treated exactly the same in Israel. Um, so there's already a lot of energy. So for sure, once they're actually back on campus and things can be a little more normal, um, I very much expect there to be a lot of noise from the anti-Israel crowd. Now, this one is directed at you because you live in Israel and it, <laughs> it's not directly related to the campus program, but I'm asking it because you live there. How have the recent announcements that the UAE, Kosovo and Bahrain have established diplomatic relations affected the mood, the national mood in Israel? Are people optimistic? It's exciting. You know, we haven't seen something like this in years. And the fact that for me to be living here and experiencing it is amazing. And, and overall, it's absolutely, the, the, the people here in Israel, any chance of peace. I mean, the thing is that Israelis want peace. And they've done, they've taken so many, they've offered so many possibilities to receive peace. Their goal is to have peace with their neighbors. So this makes them extremely optimistic. People are already talking, you know, about flights to now they can travel to Dubai. There's also been um, flights announced direct to, uh, to, to uh, Morocco. Saudi Arabia is allowing us to fly directly to um, Abu Dhabi. It's, it, these are huge, huge announcements. So, yes, it's, we're very optimistic here in Israel. Okay, now another question about more about the campuses, you know, is Hillel... Uh, helpful in countering BDS? And are the Hillels on campus, you know, are they able to basically encourage and stay strong for the students that are being subjected to this, this targeted ideological abuse, I think? Because we on hear mixed campuses, things. On many campuses, the Hillel is very actively involved in confronting BDS on campus, absolutely. On some campuses, they don't want to be as involved. Um, they're a little bit nervous or they wait a little bit to see where, where it goes. And, and sometimes, um, sometimes that's an okay decision and sometimes it's not because then things get out of hand and it's too late. So like I said, on many campuses, um, Hillel is one of the organizations that is helpful um, and is working with the students. And then in other cases, sometimes there is disagreement. Um, but for us, BDS is an anti-Semitic movement. Absolutely. And people need to understand that. So when it first rears its head, we very much feel it needs to be addressed. And it doesn't always have to be so aggressive, um, but by writing articles and connecting with other students and addressing where, what this movement stems from and what it means, um, we think is extremely important. Okay. Now, there's an, another question that was related to the previous one about the UAE and Kosovo. Mm -hmm. It's probably too much to ask that the students who hate Israel on campus somehow temper their hostility towards Israel because of, of these peace agreements. But how do you think they're going to respond? Are they going to become more aggressive because they'll, it, it makes them more desperate? Or, or are they going to acknowledge that, yeah, this, this is a big deal and maybe we need to, and I know it even sounds ridiculous for me to say it out loud, but maybe we need to temper our hostility towards Israel. You know, it's sad. It's sad because I wish it was the latter. You know, I remember Khaled Abu, Abu Tuame saying that the, the students in America are more aggressive uh, than uh, the Gazans. 
it's a it's a it's a it's a crazy situation on American campuses. So the you know short answers no, it's not going to temper them, and they're not going to acknowledge for the most part that this is actually something positive in the region. Um, from what I've seen so far, is that the they either have kind of ignored it or still addressed that there is a annexation looming and we need to do something against occupation. That that's the bigger issue. Um, and they've even had some of the some of the campuses have had events that very much explicitly say that this is a problem, that this is going around um, the back of the Palestinians, um, that this is hurting them, that, and this will only help Israel continue and expand their occupation. Um, and the Palestinian youth movement, which is very much in cahoots with the National uh, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine movement, they were very explicit in their social media. They came right out that, you know, this is a they, they, these are traitorous uh, countries to normalize, to have any type of normalization with Israel. I mentioned Haktan Bazian from 2014, anti-normalization. This is something they fully uh, push forward with. So they, they don't want to see peace between Israelis and Palestinians. They just want Israel to not exist. Now, what about teaching on a virtual environment? I, I know the camera has been able to adjust to uh, getting its message out on Zoom meetings. And also, essentially, we never really stopped doing what we did because we were publishing articles on the internet right. all the time. But do you think that the anti-Israel professors who seem to play such a huge role in all of this, are they going to have a tougher time propagating this propaganda, putting it forth in a like a virtual learning environment? What do you think? Well, um, considering that at the San Francisco State University, um, one of the departments there is planning on hosting Lila Khaled, a known terrorist part of the uh, PFLP, Popular Front for Liberation in Palestine, not just being hosted by as a guest lecturer by uh, uh, a separate event off campus. This is actually something that's part of a lecture the students will um, have to participate in, as you mentioned about Sue Jolly, they have a captive audience. They have to be there and present as this is part of the, the course. Uh, I think the anti-Israel professors are sadly finding ways around it um, and will, will continue uh, uh, with, their, with their propaganda. And, but again, without, not without a, a say from, the, from us, from camera and our allies, uh, we're very much pushing against um, the university, putting out petitions, calling for the university to do something about this. I don't think there's ever been a known terrorist that's actually participated uh, in a university lecture before. Uh, so it's still not over, uh, but that is the latest news in terms of fall 2020. Now, one of the questions that's come in is, are there any pro-Israel professors at UMass Amherst? And uh, did you discover any while you were there? Yeah, it's just a wonderful story. Uh, he sadly has passed away, but one of the most pro-Israeli professors I discovered was a journalism professor, not Jewish, man from Wisconsin, who happened to love Israel since the 60s, since the Six Day War, and it was something I knew nothing about until I actually wanted to write an article calling out Sue Jolly uh, in his original film, Peace Propaganda in the Promised Land, when I was a student at UMass. And I found this out because I just talked to everyone about what I experienced. I was shocked. So I went to Jewish, non-Jewish professors, anybody who would listen, which I think is something that I always push for our students to do. Go to the obvious, go to hello, go to Chabad, go to camera, go to people who you know, will help you, who, who you think will help you. But also there are so many people out there that support you that you wouldn't necessarily think about. And so yes, he was an extremely wonderful professor. Uh, he helped me edit that piece, even though he wasn't really supposed to. And, and, he, and I got it published a lot because of his support. And I had a few other um, post-Israeli supportive professors within the Jewish Studies Department at UMass Amherst as well. Okay. Yeah, and just as an aside, one of the things, once camera started to really highlight the problems with Sak Jolly, people reached on the UMass campus reached out to us. And I don't want to tell you who they are. I don't even want to give you any identifying characteristics uh, because I just don't want them to get canceled or harassed. But the interesting thing was is that they started to write about the problems with uh, BDS and the, the, what was going on at the campus. 
uh, once an outside organization essentially started to raise these issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, but the thing is, is that one of the issues that we deal with is, is that the morale of Jews on college campuses. And what has a bigger impact on these, on, on students and on, on the morale of Jews? Is it the anti-Israel propaganda in the classroom or is it the stuff that SJP does on the quad? Or, or, and do they have different impacts and do they feed off each other? So just to remark about what you said, Dexter, that professor that you're, that you're referring to, um, just like you, you know, you felt like you could testify because you had so much support from, from camera supporters. He felt like he could say something because of the work that you um, and our colleagues put forth. So it's something that uh, is amazing. You need support. That's pretty much the message is that people need to feel supported and that they're not alone. Yeah. And, and to answer your question, it may seem it may seem more clear or obvious to students that the social pressure is the biggest issue, um, and they feel it right in their faces. Uh, sometimes on some campuses, with the big walls that are put up and yelling at them, and even targeting them, which is really intimidating. Um, but where does it all stem from? It stems from the professors. These students are learning it from someplace, and there are students who don't take certain classes or can't major in certain departments because if they don't want to follow their agenda and, and, and write essays that are highly critical to a point that it's really just anti-Israeli, then they're, they're going to get lower grades and people care about their GPAs. Um, so it, the faculty is the biggest issue and it's something that with our center that we've established, um, and with your help and the help of our colleagues, we're really focusing on addressing, exposing more issues within the class syllabi and pressuring the universities to do more to address these issues. Now, one of the questions that's come in is the BLM movement seems to have energized an awful lot of young people. And how has it played itself out in the activism that you've seen over the past few months? And uh, how do you think it will play itself out when and if campuses open up? And you may have already touched on this a little bit, but what do you think? Well, it's complicated because as soon as the BLM, BLM movement came about, I mean, we saw back in the day, back with Ferguson, we saw already signs from Ferguson to Palestine. So we already knew that there already was some kind of connection there. And then as soon as it came back again with George Floyd, the anti-Israeli students, jumped on it, putting out pictures, coming also from the Palestinians themselves, uh, connecting Israel to, to, the, to the movement and, and, and blaming them because of JVP, I mentioned before, this Jewish organization, their campaign uh, to really put Israel at the forefront and take full responsibility for any type of violence happening in America. So that's where we're seeing it more, where SJP, if you go through their different social media pages, they're filled with petitions to support Black Lives Matter, to defund the police, to do more against racism, and then they throw in, including Zionism. It's the same thing. So if you're against racism, you're against Zionism. You cannot be a Zionist and be an ally to any of the minority communities. So it's very difficult for the Jewish students and the pro-Israeli students because I would say the majority of people are against racism, <laughs> not all, but then they're being attacked. If you're against, uh, how can you be a Zionist then? And this is a, a, a you know totally racist, xenophobic movement. Uh, so again, as mentioned before, is why we're really trying to give the students the tools to be able to combat this and point the fingers at them for being actually the real racists. Now, one of the questions that's come in via email uh, was, uh, you mentioned UMass Amherst's status as a land-grant institution and how that can be leveraged to our advantage, and I think that's directed at me. Mm -hmm. And what does federal land-grant legislation have to do with how folks deal with the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, in the Middle East? And I guess, first of all, the land-grant uh, legislation was passed in the 1860s to essentially promote the ability of Americans to, you know, work in the trades and in, in agriculture. It was meant to actually build up the American economy. And the way I look at it, and, and I look at this in part because I uh, am the father of a parent uh, 
excuse me, I'm the father of a, a, a child that attends a land grant institution these days. And the whole point, when you look at it in the broad scope, scope of these, the history of these institutions is to build a good middle class that the American people have relied upon. And w one of the things that I have seen is, is that it's ultimately uh, they have tried to undermine the confidence uh, of, of the American people uh, in a whole bunch of institutions that they care about. And I think that, and I think that's really important. And one of the institutions that they actually support over the long haul is Israel. And so I think it's part of a larger package to basically dismantle or undermine confidence in American society, which is exactly the opposite of what should be happening uh, at a land grant institution. And uh, this, you know, came to me uh, when I was att attending a, a seminar on uh, on how to pay for college education at a school somewhere out in the West, and I'm not going to identify it. And it was about uh, financial aid, and I figured out for the first time exactly how much uh, my family was going to be spending on the education of my my oldest daughter. And then after that, at some point, I was watching a Suck Jolly video, and he posted a picture of a guy by the name of Antonio Grumisi uh, uh, on, on the screen behind him and said, this guy's one of my heroes. Well, this guy was essentially a communist or a socialist that said that the whole way to basically undermine uh, society and bring about a revolution is to go through the civil society institutions. And... One of the things is that anti-Israelism is clearly part of that whole agenda. And I was like, here I am, and here are a whole bunch of other families in the state of Massachusetts, not necessarily impoverishing themselves, but paying good money to be indoctrinated against Israel. And I was like, that's intolerable. And so the thing is, is that the whole point of a land-grant institution is to improve the ability of students to think and here they were being indoctrinated. So um, I guess just one more question before this is, you know, when you deal with SGP and your, SJP and your students, uh, how do they respond when you try to bring up abuses in uh, like Arab and Muslim countries, uh, human rights abuses? I think it depends, um, but I think they respond actually most well when you bring it up that's relevant more to Israel. So if you're talking about the human rights abuses within the Palestinians, um, within the PA controlled territories and with Gaza, um, because then it's much more relevant to the story versus bringing up um, a different country, for instance. Uh, so the thing is, they respond well. They, they When students understand where the context, when students get the Hajimin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti mm -hmm. of Jerusalem, uh, or cooperate with Hitler, then they get a little bit of where the Israelis are coming from. And when they understand that it is illegal to sell land or a home to a Jew, and the Palestinians have actually been killed for this by the PA, then they get a little bit more of the situation that we're dealing with with our neighbors. So what, we can't be afraid to talk about those stories because it's part of our story, it's part of the conflict. It's a major part of the conflict. And, and lastly, when we speak about the child abuse that happens within the school system, within the ch children's television shows, where you see little tiny children, little kids, cute little children, you know, yelling about how they can't wait to be a martyr and kill Jews. I and mean, it's, it's absolute child abuse and nobody can support this. But if we don't bring it to light, you know, people won't know about it and they won't understand how they're being indoctrinated from such a young age to hate the people living a few miles away from them. I think that's about all the time we have for today's seminar. And I want to thank Aviva for her discussion and for everyone's questions and support that you've given to us during these turbulent times. On September 23rd, Camera will host an online event with Olga Michaud Washington will be speaking about Israel and the apartheid lie. Please keep an eye out for information about this and other events in your inbox. Thank you very much.